Yeah. The first thing is we've been in an everything bubble, I think, that um, a lot of money has flowed into virtually everything. Um, historically low interest rates, even zero rates have um, precipitated that bubble. Um, you've also had a lot of changes in the business world. Technology has um, accelerated, if anything, and you've seen disruption of all kinds of businesses, which creates challenges and opportunities for investors. Um, so that's another thing. Um, some asset classes have become increasingly popular. Private credit has um, had, a, had a day in the sun. You've had um, uh, speculation during that bubble in all kinds of things from crypto to meme stocks to SPACs. That there is Seth Klarman. He's the, the chief executive and portfolio manager of the Bopost Group, a leading global hedge fund. He's renowned for his expertise in value investing and is the acclaimed author of the 1991 bestseller Margin of Safety. Despite his remarkable success, with a net worth of $1.5 billion, Klarman prefers to operate away from the limelight, making him relatively unknown to the wider public. You are um, somebody who shies away from publicity. I've been trying to get you to come on the show for years. So has Andrew. So we are thrilled to have you here today. Fortunately for enthusiasts of value investing like ourselves, Seth has graciously stepped into the spotlight. And for those unfamiliar with the magnitude of Seth Klarman's influence, it's worth noting that Warren Buffett himself holds Seth in high esteem considering him among the select few investors capable of consistently outperforming the market over the long haul. When I asked Warren Buffett at one point, like people who could beat the market, because he's long talked about indexing, has always thought that indexing is the way to go. He's, there's probably about five people who could actually beat the markets over time. And you're one of the names that he, that he listed on that, um, which is huge praise um, from one of the best investors ever. But what's changed for you over time as the markets have gotten more complicated, as there's been more competition? How, how has your style evolved? While it's reassuring to hear his insights, it's also a tad unsettling when Seth emerges from his seclusion to issue a stark warning about the prevailing everything bubble and the dangers posed by rampant speculation in the stock market. However, what sets Seth apart is his balanced approach. Despite his cautionary tone, he offers invaluable guidance on how value investors can navigate these challenging market conditions. So, be sure to stay tuned as Seth shares his strategies later in the video. But for now, let's delve into the core issue Seth identifies in the stock market. I think you have to almost run harder to stay in place, that you have more competitors, smarter competitors, more information is available at everybody's fingertips. Investors need edge to be successful. They need to think about what is it they know or how are they structured that will allow them to outperform, to create alpha for their clients in a way that, that buying the average stock won't do. And so we've become a little bit more focused on private investments. We think there's more inefficiencies in some private markets than public markets. We've become more global over time. When we started, we were a couple of per people and $27 million. And Today, we're, we're almost, you know, like 25, 26 billion dollars. So it's really been an evolution in 260 people. Um, I think that you can continue to find edge, though, um, in how you structure yourself, how you incentivize your team, how you lead your team. Um, you can find opportunities in around the edges of what other people are doing, finding situations that other people are throwing out, like the baby with the bathwater. And they exist. It's, you have to be patient. They're not always there. But when they're there, they can be particularly attractive because the markets can become quite frenetic these days. While Seth acknowledges the emergence of a significant bubble across various asset classes, he underscores that this development was almost inevitable given the prolonged era of low interest rates over the past decade. With traditional low-risk assets like government bonds offering minimal returns, investors have increasingly turned to riskier alternatives such as stocks in pursuit of higher yields. However, this prolonged trend has fueled speculative fervor, leading to inflated valuations in sectors like real estate and blue-chip stocks. As investors chased returns, they ventured into more unconventional asset classes, contributing to the rise of speculative assets like cryptocurrency, meme stocks, and SPACs, as Seth is about to elaborate on. That's the genuine issue. 
As speculators see to scoop their cash somewhere else, it progressively went into theoretical resources. These are resources where you do not have a vigorous way of anticipating future cash streams, and thus can't be beyond any doubt of the natural esteem. Cryptocurrency is the classic case of this. It does not create any cash streams at all. Its esteem is inferred as it were from what the another individual is willing to pay for it. And the issue with these sorts of resources is that they tend to be greatly unstable. Beyond any doubt, they can skyrocket once in a while. But when the reins get pulled in on the economy and covetousness turns to fear, they can moreover invert course fare as rapidly. And that's what we've seen. As the advertise came to grasps with the Fed's altar of money-related arrangement, all of these resources endured overwhelming misfortunes. Cryptocurrency got pounded. Bitcoin is generally split from its crest. SPACs are parsing on. Back in 2021, Forbes notes we saw over 700 SPACs made, but in 2023 hundreds of these clear check companies have been incapable to shut bargains and see to before long be sold. Meme stocks have been smashed. GameStop is down around 70% from top. AMC is down 90%. Hell, as the encouraged raised rates all through 2022, stocks in common endured enormous misfortunes. And we're in a very peculiar financial environment right presently. Nobody is truly very beyond any doubt of what's another. Swelling has cooled for the time being, but the Fed's following move is obscure and trade execution over the board is splendid. So with that said, what does Seth think we ought to be centered on right presently as speculators? If you could put yourself back now, you were talking about investing and how it's shifted over time. But if you were, and you were also talking about the private markets, how there's a lot more opportunity there. But if you were a kid coming out of college, and we're both uh, alma mater, uh, Cornell, but you graduated in 1979, but if you were graduating today and you had to actually play, if you will, the public markets. Do you think that opportunity that you had in 1979 still exists in 2023? You know, Andrew, it's, it's such a great question. I think that markets can become more efficient. And it, there's a question in my mind about once a market becomes more efficient, whether it actually does um, have the likelihood of becoming less efficient afterwards. So for sure, there's more money in public markets, things have become somewhat more efficient. But I also see a short-term orientation that tells me that it's possible some pricing has actually become less efficient. I think when you look at Meta, uh, the stock's been all over the place in, in a reasonably short period of time, um, trade falling to under 100, then rising back up to almost 300, li literally months apart. Um, for a large, well-established company that I think everybody can analyze. So I think that there are opportunities. Now, if, if a kid came to me and said, where do you think I should potentially make my career? I would encourage them to look for the most inefficient pockets in the world. Um, I also think it's important that they get mentored, that most people aren't ready to, to just jump right into this business right out of school. So I do think there are opportunities, but people should ask themselves, Right. What, what are my interests? What kind of edge might I have? If, if you're from a different country, maybe you have great contacts in that country. Maybe you know a lot about the business culture in that country. And so my advice would be to go where you're naturally inclined and go where you think there may interest, be interesting opportunities. Obviously, a market that's setting all-time highs may not be the best place to, uh, right. to, to focus a career. Uh, this may not be about edge, but, you know, Warren Buffett's often talked about index funds. Becky was mentioning index funds to you before, which have changed the business. I think that's actually what's made them so much more efficient to a large degree. But do you also subscribe to the philosophy that if you can invest with Seth Klarman, that you should actually be investing in index funds? And that's that's the safer uh, and best path. You know, I, 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 the argument for index funds is that you're going to have low transaction costs near zero and you're going to have um, exposure to the market. You're not going to underperform the market, but neither will you outperform the market. I think for um, the average person out there who isn't um, terribly sophisticated um, and is able to take a long term view, I don't see anything wrong with index funds. But I think the one of the critical things about the long term return from investing is that it depends on the entry price. So if you enter when the market's very expensive at a high valuation, you may be disappointed because you might match the index, but the index may not do very well from there. 
So uh, the other thing is you don't want to go into index funds, experience a bad market, and then bail out. That's what investors tend to do. Right. Um, they get in at the wrong time and they get out at the wrong time. And so it, investors who go into the next fund should go in with the idea that they're going to stay through thick and thin. And you were talking also with Becky about technology. I wanted to understand how you think about the inflection point with a technology company. There, of course, was a point where Amazon might have seemed like a speculation. Today, in retrospect, you wouldn't think that. You might even look at Tesla that way. There are some people in the public market, in the, in the public right now, who think that Bitcoin and, and various cryptocurrencies are complete and utter speculation. There are others who say 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say that wasn't that wasn't one. How do you think about that distinction? You know, Andrew, one of the things that's really important, there's a, a, an enormous amount of fire hose of information coming at all of us all the time. And as an investor, I've learned to try to be focused on things that actually are going to move the needle for me and my portfolio. So I try to focus on bottom-up individual situations, stocks, bonds, um, real estate um, transactions. And I don't spend a lot of time thinking about things where I think the answer is pretty imponderable. So I do spend time thinking about technology. And part of that, at least, is to avoid being on the wrong side, to avoid being in a company that gets disrupted. I think something like crypto, which I've tried hard to understand the arguments and figure out why people are so excited about it, and I can't find value there. So I'm not making a judgment that it might not go up. I have no idea. But we focus our time where we think we might spend it productively.